Hey guys, my name is Guillermo Berganza and I'm from San Ignacio Town. Today I'll be presenting my master's thesis entitled Colonial Legacies and Democratic Development in Latin America and the Caribbean from 1982 to 2018. Since we're pressed for time, let's quickly jump right in. Okay, so uh, here's my outline. I'll discuss the research motivation background, then the research question, theoretical perspectives, hypothesis, research design, and finally I'll discuss my results. And I'll try to be as brief and uh, precise as possible. Let's move on. Research, motivation, and background. All right, so since the, the past is inextricably linked with the present, this paper builds on the, the premise that colonialism had a tremendous effect on present levels of democratic development in Latin America and the Caribbean. Colonialism in these regions is one of the most conspicuous historical events explored by many scholars and students who wish to investigate the causes and effects of the region's most pressing issues concerning democratization as an intricate part of national development. Some publications concern the uh, colonial legacies of democratic development in the developing world, but not on varying levels. Democratic development prevailed after the third wave uh, of democracy and a decolonization process, but to what extent? So the origins of the varying development patterns are what constitute the unique political and social nature of developing countries, particularly in Latin America and the Caribbean. Several scholars have argued that post-colonial institutions are extensions of colonialism, which constitutes the, the mechanisms of modern society's development. The prevalence of these institutions is a direct result of colonial administrations that heavily invested in economic and political institutions, infrastructures, technologies, and education systems according to Eurocentric standards. The institutions that European colonizers created in the New World produced inequalities as a consequence of the establishment of a hierarchical society, and uh, exploitation of uh, factor endowments uh, through a high concentration of land ownerships that also planted the seeds of globalization. So uh, then naturally the rise of democracy in Latin America and the Caribbean is rooted in popular resistance and elite politics as a result. Rebellions against uh, oppressive authority were common activities carried out by these two ethnic groups, of course, which are the, the Maya and the Africans, or the indigenous and the, the African ethnic groups in, in these regions. Um, for example, the, the, the uprising led by Tuba Cameroon, and then we have the successful slave rebellion in Haiti, which culminated in the, the first black republic in the region. And then, of course, the, the Maya rebellion in Tipu, uh, which is in Belize, that expelled Spanish invaders and a constant raiding of British logwood camps by the Mayas. And just to mention a few. So all of these popular rebellions had one thing in common. They fought for liberty and self-determination against tyranny and oppression at the hands of their colonial masters. In this sense, indigenous and African slave resistance are underpinnings for analyzing revolutionary, egalitarian, democratic reactions in Latin America and the Caribbean. Popular resistance against authoritative oppression in these regions have drawn uh, and will continue to draw significantly from colonial rebellions that serve as a fountain of inspiration. Next, we move on to research question. All right, so the general research question that I aim to address is... Uh, what explains the cross-national variation in levels of democracy? And the more specific question is, how did colonial legacies affect the current levels of democratic development in Latin America and the Caribbean? I present existing data gauging the democratic development among countries of Latin America and the Caribbean and test a hypothesis that resonates with the effects of colonialism on post-colonial political development. All right, so now we'll move on to theoretical perspectives. And this section, we have to ask ourselves, why democracy matters? Previous studies have demonstrated that the levels of democracy matter in many aspects in the domestic and international political domains. First, scholars have pointed out that high levels of democracy reduce corruption. Corruption being a multidimensional concept is generally defined as the abuse of power and trust for personal gains, usually in the form of money. It permeates political and social advancement in developing and developed countries by weakening institutions, a growing amount of studies has shown that corruption also inhibits investment, distorts government spending, and compounds social injustice and inequality through nepotism and cronyism. Now, how does democracy reduce corruption? Some scholars argue that democratic institutions and democratic values are generative forces of development, uh, of development initiatives to tackle corruption and reduce poverty. Additionally, many studies have shown that higher levels of democracy enhance uh, uh, economic development and that democracy promotes higher GDP per, uh, sorry, GDP by enacting uh, economic reforms, boosting fiscal capacity, providing education, 
and healthcare, encouraging investment and reducing social discontent. Studies also show that democracy might help reduce the likelihood of civil wars and violence. For instance, other scholars have found that as the respect for the rule of law is consolidated, levels of lethal violence and terrorism tend to decrease. Other studies show that a democratic country negatively affects the risk of civil war and institutions of partial democratic regimes are not susceptible to the onset of conflict while autocratic regimes may enact democratic reforms and political reforms that may end up in violence uh, through social mobilization. Furthermore, many studies argue that democracy reduces the probability of interstate wars. However, there is a trend in the literature concerning the democratic peace theory deriving from the universal democratic norm for peaceful conflict management despite differences in norms and values between states. Thus, democratic states manage conflicts better than other types of regimes at an early stage before they intensify into full-blown military violence, even when other factors are controlled. This norm-based logic lends support to the uh, direct positive effect on settlements due to democratic norms to resolve disputes through democratic leaders. Also, empirically, pairs of democratic states experience lower risks of interstate conflict because of non-violent conflicts, uh, conflict resolution procedures that are embedded in these democratic institutions. The democratic peace theory then holds in this case, and the possibility of conflict is frequently determined based on the political behavior of less democratic states. Scholars have argued that for a pair of democracy and non-democracy, the prospect of war is much higher when compared to a pair of non-democracies. Given that democracy matters for economic development and peace, what explains the, level, uh, the levels of democracy? The most prominent theoretical perspective for explaining democratization is arguably the modernization theory, which suggests that economic development is conducive to democracy. Another literature suggests that social mobilization matters for explaining democratization. In this sense, subordinate classes radically mobilize against the oligarchic society to advance democracy as regime and economic elites are tightly interwoven and therefore cannot be challenged from cross class alliances of political actors. Moreover, social mobilization by labor organizations has a strong effect on democratization. And um, finally, ethnic fractionalization affects democratic development, but not significantly. Okay, so per capita income is not the best predictor of democracy in the region when compared to the rest of the world that had the same income levels, which may also be a result of its distinct political features. In Latin America, democracy did not decline at some level of development, especially when per capita income increased or when high income inequality rose. This outcome is important for this research because colonial legacies and their distinctive long-term political development characteristics may be the structural variables that can fill the gap. This research posits that colonial legacies can account for the various levels of democracy in the region and may explain why some countries remain democratic in the face of uh, low levels of development. Therefore, the most significant feature of this research is that it warrants merit relative to the deterministic argument posed by modernization theory by incorporating uh, colonial legacies as a crucial structure variable. And of course, other relevant topics and debates in the literature about colonialism include uh, colonial models, regional markets, urban and rural cleavages, pre-colonial populations and ideologies, uh, and reverse virtue hypothesis, the study of the indigenous peoples of the Americas and colonial institutional frameworks. Moving on. In addition to the previously reviewed studies, again, this research suggests that different colonial legacies matter for explaining the variation in level of the, uh, levels of democracy. The literature has exposed the effectual relationship between colonial legacies and contemporary outcomes. Lange, who is a scholar, compared the sharp difference in Spanish and British colonialism. While the Spanish mode of colonialization uh, is based on the idea of mercantilism, the British model of colon colonization is based on the idea of uh, liberalism. It is noteworthy that one weakness of Lance's theory is that it fails to specify the causal linkage in within case sequences. And of course, these, these sequences account for the differences of Spanish and, uh, and British colonial legacies. So to fill this gap, I argue that it is crucial to analyze the role of social actors that link colonial legacies and post-colonial development. 
compared to Spanish colonialism, British colonialism tends to provide a more tolerant environment for social actors to mobilize and to organize, to pressure governments for policy reforms. This is because, unlike the mercantilist institutions of Spanish America, liberal institutions reflective of British identity took a more proactive position, particularly in the interwar period when, uh, when, when social movements demanded improved social welfare systems and political participation. Okay, so I also rely on Perez Linian and Meng Waring's theory of regime legacy, which was built on the concept of path dependence, but is not as deterministic. Path dependence refers to a process where past events or decisions constrain later events or decisions. In other words, it creates a locked-in effect. So what, hap uh, what, what has occurred in the past persists because of resistance to change. It suggests that once a country has developed partic a particular regime, like democracy or autocracy, uh, it is often too costly to change the system, like path dependence. In other words, the theory of regime legacy takes into consideration that a pre-existent system is reproduced over time, and that this reproduction enhances the ability for its prolonged existence. Now we move on to hypothesis. In sum, I modify Lange, Lange's theory by emphasizing the importance of social actors' agency in post-colonial democratic development. Because the British colonial legacies produce a more tolerant environment for social mobilization, civil society tends to be stronger, which would help increase levels of the uh, democratic development. Based on the discussion in, the, in, in this section, I generate a testable, a testable hypothesis, which is, compared to countries with Spanish colonial legacies, countries with British colonial legacies tend to have, a higher, tend to have higher levels of democracy. Now, let's talk about the research design. To test my hypothesis, I utilize a mixed methods approach. For the quantitative analysis, I employed a, I employed a large N statistical analysis using country level data of 33 Latin America and the Caribbean uh, countries from 1982 to 2018. The unit of analysis is country year, and the research scope contains 33 Latin American and Caribbean countries uh, from 1982 to 2018, as I mentioned before. So the total number of observations in my data set is 1,221. All right. Now for the qualitative, qualitative analysis, I conducted a comparative historical analysis for Belize and Guatemala. Through the pattern matching procedure, the comparative historical analysis examines how colonial legacies shape the environment for social mobilization and how social mobilization affects the various levels of democracy in Belize and Guatemala. Uh, the main purpose of these comparative case studies was to, to, to use qualitative evidence at the within case level to strengthen the theoretical implications derived from the large N analysis. Okay. Now we move on to empirical results. Both uh, model one and model two suggest that a country that had been colonized for a longer period tends to have a lower level of democracy. A country that used to be a British colony tends to have a higher level of democracy. For, uh, former British colonies tend to provide more voices for their citizens in the political process as, as they are more likely to hold their governments accountable, have a higher quality, of, uh, higher quality of the rule of law, and are more tolerant towards CSO's activities relative to other former European colonies. And also, a, a country with a higher level of economic development tends to have a higher level of democracy. The, the inflation rate suggests that poor economic performance has a reduction effect on the level of democracy. The ethnic linguistic cleavage suggests that a more ethnically fractionalized country tends to have a lower level of democracy. Okay, so here is uh, a picture of the, the table with model one and model two. Okay, now we move on to the case study results. Belize was colonized by Britain and Guatemala by Spain. Guatemala inherited an authoritative legacy from the Spanish Empire as it elaborates a hierarchical class and racial structure that produced caudillos after independence. Belize inherited coherent administrative, juridical, and police institutions that provide the basic infrastructures for functioning markets, an enforcement of the rule of law, a provision of public goods and education, good quality education. Next case study. Actually, the first one, Guatemala. All right. So in the decolonizing process, elites became more supportive of democratic representation in the post-independence period. 
One of the most prominent uh, social movements in Guatemala was the guerrilla factions, while in Belize it was mainly the union. A more democratic and supportive political culture emerged in Belize, unlike in Guatemala, where the, the slave, uh, I'm sorry, the, where the state violently suppressed unionism. Now we move on to Belize. The Belize National Teachers Union organized a protest in 2016 at Belopan City with its 3,000 3, members against the government's decision to defer a 3% salary increase and corruption. In 2017, many organizations in Guatemala protested in the streets against corruption and demanded the resignation of President Jimmy Morales, but he refused and ended the, the, the UNCAC, which is the United Nations Convention Against Corruption. Belize has a higher level of democracy than in Guatemala. A position, a position that is reflective of its enduring liberal colonial institutions that, in the long run, foster a better political environment for governments to respond more positively towards the demands of its civil society. All right, so this is my conclusion. The theoretical analysis of this research warrants a need for further explanation of the variation in levels of democracy in other regions of the world. Hence, Researchers who wish to explore this aspect must be mindful of the long-term political effects of other European powers that may produce varying results. For instance, more investigation can be done between the British colonial legacies of India, the French colonial legacies of Vietnam, the Dutch colonial legacies of Indonesia, the Spanish colonial legacies of the Philippines, and the British, French, and Italian colonial legacies of Africa. However, researchers must pay keen attention to the different economic modes of the colonizers an elite's response to social mobilization, both of which uh, promulgate variations in democratic development as contrasting modes of colonial legacies may produce different levels of democracy. Thank you, I hope you enjoyed. If you have any questions, please reach out to me. I, um, I'll be willing to answer. Thank you.